Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for tuning in to the Effect and tonight's show, the Peter Mack Show. I'm glad to be with you. Today is Wednesday, May 12th, and I have two guests with me tonight. Uh, we'll find out shortly if they're on the line with me. One is Stefan Kinsella. He was had been a guest with me before. He's a patent attorney in Houston. And another is a gentleman I haven't spoken with before, but his name is Robert Wicks, and um Glad to have both you gentlemen on the line with me tonight. If you're there, you might give me uh, an acknowledgement if you hear me. Yes, thank you. Is this Robert? This is Robert. Okay, I suspected that was you because your voice is different than Stefan. Stefan, so uh, hopefully he's going to be with us shortly. Um, since I haven't had you on before, Robert, why don't you just give me and my listeners a little bit of your background, perhaps uh, how you know Stefan and... Um, what your interest is in political philosophy? Well, uh, Stefan and I, uh, I was a, an avid reader of LewRockwell.com, uh, became uh, a libertarian over time, and uh, he was one of, the, uh, one of the people who I enjoyed reading. Uh, in particular, his articles on IP uh, were very interesting to me. Uh, I am a Unix systems administrator, so I do computer work pretty much for a living, and um, and the whole IP thing kind of fascinated me because as part of what technical people do in building various things, there's a lot of information sharing. That's really the only way to accomplish a lot of things. And it just always struck me as very strange that uh, intellectual property seeks precisely to stop that or to at least impede it and make it more expensive than it otherwise would be. Right. <laughs> but and, and I've discussed the topic and we'll – discuss it at length if you guys want to tonight, uh, also with Stefan, um, but in a broader sense, at least where I come from is, uh, as I said last week, I started out as a, uh, uh, I guess, a conservative and then I, a, a, a staunch a constitutionalist. I did five, six years of a show uh, supporting the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and my theme through all that time was, well, if we can just get the government back limited to the Constitution, the original meaning of the Constitution, what the founders of this country sought, then things would be pretty good in this country. And then eventually I kind of became what's called an objectivist, a, a follower of the philosophy I, Ayn Rand. And then uh, at some point I found inconsistencies with that. And so I guess now I am a full-fledged anarchist. Um, but as I said last week, that term has a very – hostile or aggressive connotation to a lot of people and uh, just wondered where uh, where where you sit on that uh, issue and if uh, if you want to expound on uh, on that uh, connotation any well anarchist is actually rather interesting uh in that i have fewer issues with anarchist than a lot of people do uh i don't mind being called an anarchist and i think that that largely has to do with sort of the um the, the the social expectation. I mean, I, I'm a black male from the rural South, and the typical person, when they're thinking of an anarchist, does not think of me. So, <laughs> okay. So when I tell them that I am an anarchist, it, it's sort of a quizzical look initially, and then I can explain I <laughs> uh, exactly what I mean by that. But I don't think that it's quite as off-putting with the people that I uh, speak to as it would be for a lot of other people who kind of would be associated with the sort of bomb-throwing uh, leftists. Right, and, 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 but that's exactly the connotation, and I'll, I'll have S uh, Stefan co comment on the same question here in a minute, if he will. But I was just watching the Larry King live show uh, a few days ago, uh, you know, shortly after this uh, uh, attempted bombing in Times Square, and Larry King had a couple uh, uh, terrorist experts on, and uh, one of the questions was, well, when did terrorism start, or in particular car bombing? And this one guy asserted that the first car bomb, if I heard him correctly, actually took place uh, near Wall Street in the 1930s. And then the guy made the comment, he goes, I think it was some Italian anarchist. And so immediately, there you have. Well, you know, and I thought to myself, really? Did they know the guy's political philosophy just because they 
tied him with a car bomb in the 1930s. But you know, I'm, I'm probably one of few people watching the show that that had that reaction. So, uh, Stefan, if you're there, uh, give us your um, experience when you tell people uh, that you're an anarchist, if you use that label or if you don't, what you use and and so on. Um, yeah, hey, glad to be here. Hey, Rob. Um, you know, I think mostly I, I use that around uh, uh, people that are already interested in talking about politics. Uh, I mean, it just doesn't come up with talking with my parents or <laughs> a neighbor down the street. I mean, unless they drill down into it, but we hardly ever get deep enough along where that, you know, it's radical enough to, to not vote, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> um, but um, I kind of get a lot of semantic de- debates among people, and, and uh, a lot of libertarians uh, focus a lot um, on strategy and uh, tactics and what what works and what persuades and a lot of them retreat to this idea about, um, you know, I don't like labels. I don't want to pin myself, you know, down. Um, and I, I kind of don't have that approach, and I actually don't agree with that approach. I mean, I, I have no problem with labels. We're conceptual beings, and we come up with words that denote these concepts. Um, it's just clear thinking. I don't, I don't really know what, why people are opposed to labels. Uh, inaccurate labels I could see being opposed to. And then you have some libertarians who say, well, I don't want to say I'm an anarchist because that alienates people. But, you know, to my mind, the question is whether it's true or not. Okay? And uh, so you, you get that kind of strategic concern. Uh, that's my poodle, excuse me. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and then the other would be sort of the, uh, the debates among sort of libertarians and fellow travelers uh, who want to fight over who's the real anarchist, you know, like the left libertarians or the anarcho-syndicalists and the libertarians, who I view as the only true uh, consistent anarchist. But to distinguish, you know, I often say anarcho-libertarian, just to make it clear uh, okay. of, of what kind of libertarian we are. We are, libertari- we are anarchists who are opposed to the state because the state is seen as the institutionalized agency that... Uh, invades property rights. Uh, other people might be opposed to the state for other reasons, but right. anarcho libertarians are opposed to the state for that reason. Okay, uh, you, you know, you, you brought up the term libertarian, and I, boy, that even has, I think, a, a wider connotation, as, as I think you alluded to there. Some people call themselves libertarians who uh, you and I and, and Robert might refer to as minarchists, or people who want, you know, small government, uh, and some would use the term to refer to themselves as anarchists, and and others, uh, I'm not quite sure. Maybe they're simply aligned with um, the um, the Libertarian Party. And um, so, I, I agree with you. I think I think it's important if you're going to have any discussion to make sure you're clear on uh, the definition of the terms you're using. There's few things are more frustrating than arguing with somebody over a point and then finding, you know, 15 minutes into the conversation that you're using the terms about what you're arguing differently. So I I agree with you in that sense. Um, Another term that comes up is uh, capitalism, Uh, you know, laissez-faire capitalism and and are you a capitalist and that sort of thing. And and I think you mentioned uh, when we were talking about preparing for the show here uh, that – uh, there's some debate even among uh, libertarians, <laughs> not using that word precisely perhaps yet, about what capitalism is. You, what do you, you know, go ahead, either one of you, what your thoughts are on that. Um, maybe I'll start and Wix can give his, his thoughts. Um, and one reason I thought we could speak about this was uh, the blog um, that Rob Wix and I are co bloggers on is the Libertarian Standard. And when we were forming it a couple of months ago, we were describing what you know, what our basic philosophy is. And most of the bloggers are sort of Austrian economics-influenced anarchist libertarians. And, uh, you know, the word capitalist in the last, say, 30, 40, 50 years has been fairly widely used, at least by economists and conservatives and uh, libertarian theorists, is more or less a synonym for libertarianism, like Ayn Rand and Mises and even Milton Friedman, these guys. Um, or at least it's been used to describe an economic aspect of a free market order that is consistent with a part of a libertarian society. Um, but in recent years, some of the left libertarians have been raising an increasing um, uh, sort of a, a 
fight about this, and they're, they're trying to basically argue that we shouldn't use the word capitalist to describe us. In fact, some go so far as to say that we should call ourselves socialists, which to me makes no <laughs> okay. sense. Part, part of their argument for uh, of rejecting and jettisoning capitalism is that the word has been uh, – has, a, has an origin and has so much baggage that's, that's associated with crony capitalism or corporatism or right. state capitalism that we shouldn't use it. And yet they want to use socialism, which has even more anti-libertarian baggage, if nothing else. So it makes no sense right. to me to do that. Um, so, you know, I think they have some point. The, the origin of the term might have been used as a, uh, as a smear. Uh, but words change their meanings over time. Even the word liberal used to mean something roughly libertarian and no longer does. The question is, what is the current meaning of capitalism? And the dictionary says it's the private ownership of the means of production. And I agree that that is not all of libertarianism, but it does describe an aspect of the free market or the economy of a libertarian society. Although I agree there's still some baggage. People associate capitalism with sort of the way things are done now in the West. Right, right, which is which is corporations in bed with the state, and so it, right. it, it does have some unfortunate associations. But I think the same argument can be made for even free market or laissez-faire. I mean, opponents of, of of property rights and free enterprise can say, well, under free enterprise, the government bails out corporations. You know, so I think we just yeah. have to fight these misconceptions and, and make it clear that we are. If we say we're for capitalism, we're for laissez-faire, free market capitalism, not crony capitalism, not corporatism. That said, I have begun to call myself in the last several years an anarcho-libertarian instead of anarcho-capitalist, just to just to have clearer communication. Very good, Robert. What's your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I agree with Stephen. Um, I typically, if I'm going to describe myself, I describe myself as an anarchist or a libertarian, or I have adopted his term anarcho-libertarian as well. Um, capitalist has never meant crony capitalism to me. Uh, typically, the people with whom I've associated, that's not really what they explicitly mean by it. If we, um, you know, if you, if you think about when you hear a politician saying something about a market failure, they talk about the dangers of unrestrained capitalism and the need to rein things in. They don't say that we need to make the system more capitalist, meaning more crony capitalism. They talk right. about the, ca- the capitalism being the cause of some problem that they're supposedly there to fix. So I've always thought of capitalism as being sort of the antithesis of government regulation. Yeah, and, and you know, I would agree that we can, you know, we can define whatever terms we want. In fact, um, I found in one of Henry Hazlitt's books that he, he, he tried to put forth the word cooperatism as a description of what we all favor, and I think that's actually not a bad term. We're in favor of cooperation, which, which right. implies a whole host of things, which imply property rights and peacefulness and civilization and things like that. But as long as we define our terms carefully, that's fine. But what concerns me is I think there is a little sleight of hand among some of the more vocal uh, left libertarian and mutualist opponents of the word capitalism. You know, on the one hand, they act like it's just semantic. They say we shouldn't use the word because it was a, it was originated as a as a pejorative for for free markets. We shouldn't use it because it's associated nowadays with crony capitalism. And yet, it's like as soon as they get you to agree to that. They really are in opposition to the free market that we envision and that we call capitalist. In other words, they are opposed to the substance underlying the term. Uh, they don't think that a free market libertarian order would, uh, would, would have uh, mass employment and hierarchies and institutions and division of labor uh, and international trade as much as we all think we would have. You see, I think more standard libertarians believe that when the state gets out of the way, you would have even more trade. You would have even more division of labor. You would have more productivity and maybe even mass production, not less. Um, right. So these guys either think it's unjust to have the institution of employment, they believe there's some kind of labor stealing going on, or they think it rests mm-hmm. upon some kind of um, property rights that are invalid, like distant ownership by the, by the landlord or by the employer owning something from afar. And they think that some kind of theft of the property rights of the workers and the and the tenants who have some kind of natural right to the property because they're currently in possession of it. So they basically have a different conception of property rights, and they actually oppose not the word capitalism, but they oppose the capitalist order that 
that regular libertarians think would flourish under a free society. And I think it's fine to disagree on that, but I don't think they should mask it by trying to say that we should just drop the word capitalism, because what they're really disagreeing with, in some cases, is the underlying substance. Uh, I agree, and I think one of the ways what... Okay, you got it now? I'm oh. sorry. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. Okay, okay. It accidentally muted a Skype here. Anyway, one of, one of the things I, I try to do, gentlemen, is cut to the chase early on in one of these debates, whether uh, one begins to get entangled in you know semantic arguments and say to somebody, look, my position is any two actions between individuals are of one of two kinds. It's either voluntary or it's based on coercion. Which do you favor? And, and almost everybody will say, well, of course people should interact voluntary. You know, somebody shouldn't use force to compel somebody to do something he, he or she doesn't want to do as long as they're, you know, not harming somebody else. And anyway, and they agree with that. And then, and then you start talking about the logical consequences of that. And you, and, you know, either quickly or after a while you say, well, how could you have government then? And they're like, well, well wait a minute. You want to get rid of government? Government, you know, they don't see the, um, I'll call it the logical schism between claiming that all interactions between people should be voluntary and the very existence of government. They don't see a logical problem with that. And, and to me, as we try to advance a discussion in the wider society about this, uh, about this political philosophy, we have to get people to engage that and look at that and, you know, and however long it takes, point out the inconsistency between the one claim on the one hand and um, uh, the claim that we should have government in addition to that or yeah, with that or to support that. But by the way, Nozick described what you first described uh, as capital. we should permit capitalist acts between consenting adults. So okay, let's let's clarify that when we come back. We're right at, we're up against the break. Uh, Stefan, we'll be back here in just a couple minutes, folks. Stay with us. The time is now. As the walls are closing in on America, Republic Magazine is a beacon of light guiding those that fight for freedom and the restoration of America. Republic Magazine is the ultimate activist tool. Republic Magazine digs in deep to expose the lies and offers real solutions from the experts. No other publication in America offers the real news like Republic Magazine. Get copies to give to friends, family, and neighbors, or simply order a subscription for yourself at republicmagazine.tv. Get informed and stay informed with Republic Magazine, the ultimate resource for your fight against the New World Order. Claim your free digital copy now or order a print subscription online at www.republicmagazine.tv. That's republicmagazine.tv. Or call them toll free at 800-873-1620. That's 1-800-873-1620. You can feel that squeaky clean sensation like none other with Vitamer Toothpaste and Mouthwash. Vitamer Toothpaste and Mouthwash is a unique natural formula not found in any other oral care products. With a gentle combination of zinc, folic acid, myrrh, and clove oil, Vitamer effectively whitens teeth, removes plaque, and freshens breath. And it does it naturally without any harmful chemicals. Visit us online at Vitamer.com. That's V-I-T-A-M-Y-R.com. Or call us today to place your order at 1-888-558-8482. That's 1-888-558-8482. Keep your teeth and gums healthy with Vitamer Toothpaste and Mouthwash. Vitamer. Nature's answer to healthy teeth and gums. And remember, it's all completely natural. Available at participating health food stores nationwide. This is the micro effect. The micro www.themicroeffect.com.
Okay, we're back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my special guest with you today are uh, Russell Fix and Stefan Kinsella, and we're discussing anarchism, libertarianism, trying to define those terms with sufficient precision so that we can go forward. And uh, just at the break there, I had to cut you off. Sorry, uh, Stefan. Uh, you were yeah. refining or, or correcting something well, I had said I just before that, about you know the voluntary the nature of voluntary interaction between people. I think right. I was just making the comment that one of the, the famous um, uh, sort of uh, sayings by Robert Nozick, who was a famous uh, libertarian philosopher, was that we should be in favor of capitalist acts between consenting adults. And I'm just pointing out that even he used the word capitalist in a clearly libertarian with a liber- clearly libertarian connotation. Um, as, as, as did Rand and Rothbard and Mises and Friedman and, and all the libertarian uh, greats of the last 40 years. Um, not that we should not uh, take into account some of the, the baggage of the claim now, but to, to argue that it clearly means crony capitalism is just wrong. Right, and that's what I guess I would have a hard. I, I, I would not be in favor of using that description of voluntary transactions just because of the as you put it, the baggage associated with capitalism uh, that I think is inherent in almost any conversation with people, particularly those outside of our sort of right. I, I philosophical think sphere. Was, I, I think he was addressing the fact that most people would sort of, at that time that he was addressing, would already agree with personal liberty. So he was saying, right. well, if you believe in personal liberty, what about other consenting acts? So that was his point. But um, Right. Robert, any thoughts on uh, that or, or your experience in talking to people about, you know, voluntary interaction between people and, and the logical consequences of that? Well, I find that uh, people typically, if you just casually ask them, do understand uh, and do appreciate voluntary interaction, and they believe generally that is the correct way to go. Um, there are some exceptions. Uh, in particular, you know, one of the things that I encounter um, – you know, kind of coming from my upbringing. My parents uh, were both public school teachers and lifetime members of the NAACP. They were very, they are, well, not were, they are very typical um, black liberals from the rural south, meaning there are certain aspects which are conservative, uh, some of the social values. But then there are certain other aspects, particularly when it comes to anything that has to do with discrimination, where they're extremely liberal. And those sorts of people tend to be much more frightened of the quote-unquote free market. And I think that some of that has to do with the fact that a lot of the rhetoric that we hear commonly, you know, you start saying, well, we used to be more free in 1830. Now, for a black person from Mississippi, that just sounds completely ludicrous. <laughs> right, right. And um, so, so I think that a, a lot of it has to do with the fact that they that the, that when uh, when they're talking to someone who's coming from that perspective, neither one of them is really thinking of exactly the same thing. That doesn't mean that either one of them is attempting to gloss something over or to think anything wrong. But they're, but they're just not thinking of the same things. And until you get that meeting of the minds where you're actually realizing and kind of understanding things in the same way, you, you have a you have a communication problem. Um, one of the things I like to uh, comment on Stephen talking about people opposing the term capitalism is that uh, a lot of the people who oppose that term seems to me are very they they they're very much uh, consequentialist they they believe that the free market will have certain characteristics and they concentrate their efforts on those characteristics rather than on the freedom itself and there's always a great danger in doing that sort of thing it's it's difficult enough for us to predict the behavior of people who are heavily regulated and controlled as we have now, how much more difficult is it to predict what a bunch of free people would do? Right. So, so the idea that you really think that, that the free market will definitely look this particular way, which is radically different from everything that has come before, sure, it will be radically different. But to say that you actually know exactly where that radical difference is just seems to me to be kind of a pointless endeavor. Yeah, I would, um, I, I would say that it, it, I agree with that. It seems like a lot of the, uh, the, the capitalist opponent libertarians, who are, they are principled and they are anti-state and they're, they're pro-right, but they seem so wrapped up in this sort of leftist program, this whole Marxist idea that there's exploitation, there's alienation, 
from uh, hierarchy. They, they, you know, they, they kind of they, they speak in sort of uh, less rigorous terms about oppression. We're all against oppression, right? We're against authority and authoritarianism and the oppression of women. And, and you know, they speak all this kind of leftist language about workers and things like this. And you know, I try to I try to pin them down and say, listen, if you just have a prediction that's different than mine. That's okay. We can have different predictions because we can all agree we could have a free market order, a private property order, and we could see what happens. And if I'm wrong, so what? If you're wrong, so what? But sometimes you see when you push them, they will say, yes, I predict it, but it's more than that. They, some of them actually believe that there's an unjustness in defending and assigning property rights along more or less Lockean lines, which I believe is the sort of prototypical libertarian idea. And so, you know, if you could just get clarity, I think that helps. It, it, it helps uh, communicate better about it, exactly where the differences are. Robert, um, I, I, it's interesting what you point, what you mentioned about your parents. So I, I'm going to put a question to you, and, and, and both of you can chime in and talk about it. Uh, and we're probably two minutes away from the break at the bottom, so I'm sure we won't uh, have time to totally uh, hash this out. But in a, in a totally free market society, there would be no laws telling a business owner who has employees who he can hire. So that person could discriminate against black people if he wanted to. Now, my feeling is the free market would take care of that, and, and certainly people could criticize that publicly and so forth. But there would not be a law saying you cannot, you know, you have to hire so many black people or whatever. Now, I suspect just based on what you said about your parents, your parents would be abhorrent at that. They would say, we can't, that's exactly what we need government for, so that people won't do that, so employers won't be discriminating against blacks or whoever, people with red hair or what have you, you know, uh, absent government laws to that. What's, I'm curious about what your thoughts are on that and what kind of conversation you would have with your parents about that topic. Well, yeah, when my, my dad and I have conversations like that on a fairly regular basis. And to some degree, he has actually come around to some of my ways of thinking, in particular when he had several thousands of dollars that he quote-unquote owed to the IRS. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, you definitely get that, that sort of an attitude. And the thing that I always look to point out is, unlike what maybe some people have been saying, there, it was not some sort of free market utopia then. And I start pointing out all of these areas of incredible state interference um, that, uh, that, that the state always sought uh, to cut off uh, various aspects of the free market, typically with some measure of pro popular support by a threatened group, any group which sees itself now open to any sort of competition, be it socially or economically, that it was never open to before. People within that group will will, uh, will react negatively toward it and try to have whatever it is that threatens them banned. And right. And, well, I'm sorry to cut you off, but <laughs> we'll hold that thought. We'll continue as soon as we get back. Yeah. See me, sir? Well, I did, but now that I do, I'm not so sure. Sir? Johnson, I got a mission for you that could change your life. Oh, good, sir. It involves traveling halfway around the world without so much as half a clue of where you're going or what you're going to do when you get there. Situation normal, sir? Uh -huh. Right, I'll be leading this mission, Johnson, so I'll be telling you what to do. You, sir? That's right, Johnson, and I say first things first. Oh, good plan, sir. And when I say as first is food. Always remember that, Johnson. Food is a big deal. Sir, my brother-in-law can guess a really good deal on some surplus MREs. Johnson, if you've got half a brain and that empty head of yours, you'll call the Free a dry guy like I did. That food is better for you, rehydrates faster, and it's good, Johnson. And it keeps for up to 30 years. Will we be gone that long, sir? Well, I hope not. Now get your supplies organized and meet me down at the pier at dawn on Sunday. We sail at sunrise. Yes, sir. This adventure is brought to you by the Freeze Dry Guy. Call 866 404 3663 or visit freezedryguy.com. When you build your own firearm, you build confidence. 
KT Ordnance offers the best ATF-approved 80% kits that can be made into firearms. And when you build your own firearm, you know it inside and out. You know how it fires. You take pride in ownership. Head to KTOrdnance.com for a great father-son or father-daughter firearm build, like the 45 caliber KT-1911, or choose the 50 caliber KTP-50 that fires a 275 grain bullet for pure stopping power. KT Ordnance's kits are fully legal, ATF-approved, 80% firearm kits with no serial numbers, no background check, and no government 4473 forms to fill out. Go to KTOrdnance.com and get yours today. That's K-T-O-R-D-N-A-N-C-E.com. KTOrdnance.com. Building your own firearm is fun, and you acquire useful skills, especially at times like these. Remember, when you build your own firearm, you know it inside and out. KT Ordnance also accepts gold and silver payments. Visit KTOrdnance.com today. The time is now. As the walls are closing in on America, Republic Magazine is a beacon of light guiding those that fight for freedom and the restoration of America. Republic Magazine is the ultimate activist tool. Republic Magazine digs in deep to expose the lies and offers real solutions from the experts. No other publication in America offers the real news like Republic Magazine. Get copies to give to friends, family, and neighbors, or simply order a subscription for yourself at republicmagazine.tv. Get informed and stay informed with Republic Magazine, the ultimate resource for your fight against the New World Order. Claim your free digital copy now or order a print subscription online at www.republicmagazine.tv. That's republicmagazine.tv. Or call them toll free at 800-873-1620. That's 1-800-873-1620. A question for you. Do you know what is in the air you're breathing? Do you know what chemicals are placed in the water you drink? Would you like to combat these intrusions? I'm not just talking toxins. I'm talking about chemicals that are harmful. Maybe now you understand why you feel tired so much. Change your life with Life Change Tea. Cleanse from toxins and chemicals and lose weight. Receive energy. There is no better investment than your body. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Or you can call us at 928-308-0408. That's 928-308-0408. Friendly operators will take your order and answer your questions. Be set free and live better. GetTheTea.com. This is... The Micro Effect. The Micro Effect Broadcasting Network. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. You're listening to the Peter Mac Show on this Wednesday, May 12th. My special guests are Robert Wicks and Stefan Kinsella, and uh, we are discussing really what it would be to like to live in a voluntary society where all interactions between people are voluntary. There's uh, no coercion used against anybody as long as he or she is not, you know, harming someone else, violating somebody else's rights. And, and uh, just prior to the break, I was asking Robert how his parents would react to him. He described as uh, liberal blacks, um, if I understood him correctly, if, if we were to go to a system in which there were no laws that prevent discrimination and, and I think you were just starting to launch into Robert your discussion about protected groups and their efforts you know often to, to use the power of the government to protect them and yes and you know the thing I always try to point out is that that you know people attempted to use the government to protect themselves from what was other uh, criminal aggression now and, uh, you know, the thing I always try to point out is that this was by no means some sort of a free market that we had in the past, uh, that it was anything but free, in fact. There were all kinds of restrictions and forcible limitations. And the thing is that uh, and sometimes it seems like people kind of skip this over, but when you start having a lot of regulations and forcible government, not only do you have the direct effect of the state's action on human beings, but you also have the human beings' reactions and their internalizing of some of these ideas that, that 
they end up having forced upon them. So the state warps the culture itself. So essentially that the more status that you have, uh, these things kind of go hand in hand, but the more, the more status a particular society is, then the more morally corrupt it becomes, and the more morally corrupt in the criminal sense that the people are, then the more status they're going, uh, society they're going, they're going to establish. So even if you had fewer laws on the books, in um, 1830 in Mississippi, what you had was a, a, a society filled with people who largely, uh, who, well, I wouldn't say largely, I wouldn't say there was a majority, but a, 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 a number of those people, in particular the more wealthy people and the people who could, who could help to, um, who could popularize certain ideas and give cogent, educated defenses to certain ideas, those people were largely a criminal class. So when you have a, a sort of a criminal class as, as the leaders of society, then yeah, you're going to have some you're going to have some some weirdness where you're going to have widespread criminality even in the absence of extensive numbers of laws. Okay, um, but and, and Stephen's chiming here, you know, at any point if you want. But I'm still trying to get a sense of. I mean, it, do you not think that your parents, like most quote unquote liberal blacks, would would find it a huge step backwards if we were to get rid of uh, the so-called civil rights legislation that that prohibits discrimination uh, by employers or against blacks and 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 quotas and 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 that sort of thing. Uh, most of them, I think, believe that that was a necessary for blacks and you know other op- oppressed people to uh, find some upward mobility in society. Yes, that, that's a very common sort of attitude. It's actually a bit more of a mixed bag than um, I think some people might realize. My dad actually has has changed his attitude toward um, things like affirmative action and even um, forced uh, desegregation considerably than what he was when he was a young man. He sees that he sees how some of these things have had some very unintentionally destructive sorts of effects. Um, so I think there is the ability to make progress there. Now, I would definitely say that overwhelmingly the vast majority of blacks, uh, at least the politically active types, would would agree that, that these things are necessary in order to promote some sort of fair society. But that 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 sort of that, that regime is is sort of crumbling and um, you know I I told my father that uh, that some things probably will not change honestly until his generation dies off. Because when you go through some very stressful sorts of uh, situations, it changes how you think about everything. And there are certain things that you can really never get past because the, the, because you associate so many, so many painful memories with them. Um, and so I think that to some degree, some of this stuff, we're just going to have to wait it out, that uh, some of the people who are in their 60s and 70s, they just have to go. And once, once, and once you have people who don't have some of that baggage, then you can start to look at some of these things much more soberly and just actually see, well, what are these things doing now? You know, uh, that, that, uh, what Robin said, uh, I, I was uh, mentioning something similar to, uh, on another show just two days ago. Uh, uh, that's the idea of, you know, Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions, right? The idea that it's not like everyone sees the light for a new idea. It's just that the old generation dies off and makes room for the new generation to see the truth. And I, I agree with Wick. That's the only probably way we can have truth, is generational truth or generational change. Um, and, and Rob knows that I'm, a, I'm an oppressed minority, too. I'm an honorary, uh, I'm a hereditary Cajun, and we're, we're <laughs> even more oppressed than, than the Africans <laughs> okay. in this country. <laughs> hereditary Cajun, okay. But actually, I, I think there's, I, I mean, I think some of the things Rob is describing about blacks, uh, about um, uh, you know, they're buying into affirmative action, it, it's, I think it's just the same old opportunism among the you know, the Jesse Jackson types, combined with just being brainwashed in school just like everyone else. But in a way, there's one advantage, and that is that, uh, you know, I think we do need to start exploding this myth that's grown up in libertarianism about sort of this innate idea that the original American founding was sort of a proto-libertarian, almost, we almost got it right, guys. You know, we were right, almost right. perfect, right? That was sort of Rand's mentality and all these Constitution worshippers now. In fact, they use the Liberty Bell or they'll use the Constitution as sort of a, a, a metonymous stand-in for, for liberty or libertarianism. And, you know, you get someone like Rob and he'll say, what are you talking about? We were slaves. 
You know, right. this wasn't the good old days. So I think that the, the kind of breath of fresh air can help. But um, I think that maybe one strategy that can work with, with, uh, with, with uh, let's say, minorities that are reluctant to give up on the on the laws that, that, that prevent discrimination is it's sort of what happened with me with, like, immigration. I mean, you know, there are undoubtedly problems with immigration nowadays. I mean, right. Arizona's suffering a lot of problems. Right. Uh, there's no doubt that the immigration policy of the states caused problems, right? But right. if you're a really consistent libertarian and you understand the nature of the state and you understand that the real enemy is the state, then you, you just rule out of court that the state is a solution to this problem. The state causes the problem. So you just know that you cannot turn to the state to solve this problem. And, you know, likewise, I think that, like, liberals in general and, say, blacks in terms of some of these minority protection programs, you know, they hate the government in some ways. They hate the lynchings that were permitted. They hate the, the, the Jim Crow laws, the slavery. And yet they want to trust the government to defend their rights. I mean, I think if you just let them know, you cannot trust these people to defend your rights. You can't trust them. Um, and on a related topic, I, I mean, I was just talking today with someone about this. A similar thing happened with the FCC, for example. I listen, and Wix does too, to all these uh, sort of tech pundit shows like Twit. And these guys are sort of kind of happy liberals. They're fairly thoughtful. They're decent on technology, punditry issues. But, you know, they kind of they, they tend to the California new generation tolerance, but, you know, we should balance everything out kind of ideas. And a few weeks ago, they were they were debating the FCC's um, uh, attempted uh, net neutrality regulations, which which they were struck down in court temporarily, anyway. And you know, they were at least grappling with the issue. They're saying, well, on the one hand, you have Comcast and these guys stifling, uh, imposing uh, tiered pricing and uh, uh, doing bit sniffing and all this stuff, and that's bad. And on the other hand, the FCC, do we really want to give them the authority to do this? But they were sort of contemplating it with this kind of giddy, liberal, glassy-eyedness that, you know, maybe it's a good idea, maybe it's not. And then just a couple days ago on Twitter, they are talking with outrage about the FCC's authorization or attempted authorization of um, the Hollywood movie industry's ability to reach in over the Internet and turn off the analog outputs of people's audiovisual equipment, their media equipment in their houses, to stop them from possibly pilfering uh, – uh, things and I think I even one of them say someone said well I suppose I buy a Blu-ray disc and I try to play it on my Blu-ray player and I can't even play it because Sony has turned off the analog output remotely without my permission and someone and Sony's answer was well write a letter to the FCC now imagine yeah. on a Sunday night you're trying to watch Avatar on Blu-ray and it won't work even though you bought it so the point is these guys are outraged at the FCC and yet they want to trust the FCC possibly, you know, on, on the issue of net neutrality. I think if you point you these things out to people... Yeah, so let's, I'm serious. I, go, go ahead. I was just saying, if you point these things out to people, tell people, look, you cannot trust this government, the one that you hate justifiably for other things they've done to you. You can't trust them right. to be a defender of your rights. Well, uh, of, of course, but also it seems to me, and I think this is... Perhaps the hardest part or, or, or the, the, the greatest challenge that I face when confronting people with these ideas is, is, to, is to point out their inconsistencies. And that's what, as you were speaking about these, uh, these liberals, these California types, if, if I understood you right, Stefan, they're, you know, on the one hand, they, they, they want freedom. On the other hand, they want some control by the FCC because they don't like certain things they see going on. And if you try to point out inconsistencies with people, my experience is, People don't like to have inconsistencies in their philosophical position point, uh, pointed out. They get very defensive, yeah, and right. they start being evasive and aggressive. And, uh, you, you know, you say, look, I'm just trying to point out, you know, I mean, you can't be right about something if you're not consistent. I mean, that's <laughs> bottom line logically. So I'm just trying to point out, you know, maybe some of your ideas are correct, but if they're inconsistent with something else, Logically, then you can't be 100% correct. And if our goal is to have a coherent philosophy, you know, at the bottom line, it has to be consistent. But it's just, you know, I, I'm probably the same way, you guys. But you know, I don't think somebody likes having somebody else point out to them that they're inconsistent on anything. And yet, it seems to me at the heart of 
the battle that we're fighting and trying to get people to think philosophically about what the the complete logical ramifications of a completely voluntary society are, you necessarily are going to have to confront people with that. Well, I, I think the problem is that, um, you know, most people, this seems obvious to you because you think deeply about these things, but most people don't have the, the interest or the equipment to sort of, you know, they realize, they sense that if, if, they sense that if they want to challenge these inconsistencies, they're going to have to develop a pretty coherent, rigorous worldview, and they know that they're not equipped to do that. So I think they sort of give up in frustration, either the nitpickers, or they just pick one side or the other, and they say, okay, well, then I'm going to be this one. And that might explain, in a way, the left-right divide. <coughs> you know, the reason some people just choose to uh, agglomerate these, uh, the, the leftist or the liberal side of, 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 free, of right and uh and some choose the conservative side. They sort of accept the package deal that they're given in society. They don't know how to they don't know how to uh, reconcile them, but they take the one that kind of emulates one of the values most important to them, and they stick with it. Yeah. You know, I mean, I just to continue one more line on this, and I, I was I was at a movie with a friend of mine, uh, uh, another professor when I was one. Uh, a, a woman who um, I would describe as pretty liberal. She's an English professor, you know, and I, I think it's a, a fair generalization that most people in humanities are are pretty pretty liberal. Uh, and one time we had a discussion like this, and I said to her, I said, uh, well, you know, all transactions between two people are they're either voluntary, or they're based on coercion. And her her response was, well. I would have to think about that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'd have to get into political philosophy a little bit. And, and I didn't follow up. I wanted to say, what the hell are you talking about? It's just, it's an either-or situation. How, you don't have to, you don't have to know anything about political philosophy or history or, or Marxism or anything. It's just, you know, what what other kind of interaction can there be if it's not voluntary and it's not coerced? What is it? What's left? I, I didn't follow up because it was not that kind of situation to do so. But, you know, I mean. I guess I'm asking somewhat, do you guys face the same frustration? You're talking to people, and it's like, what else can it be? You know, choose your ground. If you want to have coercion, okay, and we can talk about the ramifications of that, but don't pretend like when you're advocating on... Let me, let me just say, you know, I, I will say one thing, that I, I've actually been pleasantly surprised that when I have this kind of conversation with people that are willing to have it, if you point out, a, a, you know, something, for example, I had this kind of quasi-neocon friends, and I'll point out, you know, they'll criticize Obama, and I'll say, but, but Bush did X, Y, and Z, which is very similar. And they'll sort of put their head down, and they'll say, true, you have a good point. And w I feel when I have someone admit that, I've made a good point, you know, and I think, that, and they're, they're fairly honest, and they admit it. Now, the people that are not honest enough to admit those kind of things, I don't know. Maybe they're not even worth talking to very much. Um, or maybe someone who's strategically better than I can figure out a way to do it. But I, I don't know what to do when you have someone who's stubbornly irrational. Hello? Hello? Rob, you there? I'm still here. Well, I guess we've lost our host. Sounds like it. Well, Rob, tell me more about your upbringing in the South. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was wonderful. You know, no shoes and uh, cow patties as far as the eye could see. <laughs> Have you ever milked a cow? Uh, only once, my uncle. I mean, but it's like I didn't milk the cow like for any cow in a long time. I just touched the teeth. I mean, by the time I, I came around, nobody did that for any kind of real purpose. So my uncle just kept some stuff around just to play around with. I, I was going to tell Peter that you find a way to turn any issue into IP. And so, <laughs> so, like, you know, if, if you get home late from work one night because of a traffic jam, you'll say, your wife will say, what happened to you? My was late because of IP, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, I do see a lot of that going on. I, I think that's probably, you know, I, I'd say that IP and drugs are the most pervasive domestic rights violations that the government engages in. I mean, they're just everywhere. agree. <laughs> and, 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 they're, and, and IP is even in a way more insidious because at least the drug war, people sort of know that, a lot of people know that there's nothing wrong with smoking a little marijuana and they know that there's something wrong with this. But 
IP is just totally confused by this whole morale. Yes. It is, it is much more dangerous from the standpoint of intellectual dishonesty and moral corruption. Uh, people buy into that. It, 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 it really is kind of amazing how people people buy into it. Well, you know, over the years, I've, I've, I've tried to I've tried to grapple with this in my mind, and and, uh, and when I finally settled on what I thought was the right solution, and I, you know, I think I did. Um, but I've been I've, I've tried to grapple with ways of explaining different aspects of it, and I sort of settled on. I mean, basically, it's about learning. Basically, if you're in favor of IP, you're opposed to the idea of learning. Right? <laughs> it, it, it very much is true. You know, it seems to me that only an advanced civilization could actually have IP, but a civilization really can't become very advanced um, <laughs> if they have IP at the beginning. You know, it's, I think well, that's true. And so it's a very strange sort of thing because you start looking at what builds your civilization, and it's just the opposite of what IP is trying to do. Well, you have the problem is you have these simple-minded patent lawyers like um, to, to defend the system for obvious um, reasons, and you know, they'll say, "Well, America is the most prosperous country in all of history," and they started in 17, you know, say 91 or 89 or something, and they had a patent act right around that time. Isn't that a coincidence? You know, and I'm like, "Well, that's a great argument, there, guys." You know, mm -hmm. correlation is causation to these people. Right. You know, and, and you can make that argument with with anything. I mean, you know, a massive uh, slave infested cotton industry. Hold on, hold on a second. Hold on a second. I've got to call myself. They might be. The, hello, this is Stephen Kinsella. Hey, Peter. Wix and I are talking on the radio show right now, and uh, we're, we're going. <laughs> Just so let me hang up. Okay. Bye. Oh, oh. Wix, that was Peter. He said he called me on my cell phone. He said he's trying to get back on, so he said keep going. Oh, so, okay. <laughs> So uh, this is the Wish Radio Show. Go ahead, take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, it, it's it's really kind of amazing that uh, that that people really do buy into IP in the way that they do, and to the extent that they do. You know, anytime you start getting into something which is so ridiculous that you're not even sure when you're breaking the law, which is what some some of the, the patent stuff essentially ends up amounting to. It's, I mean, what could be more ludicrous than doing something in your own house and actually wondering whether or not you're breaking the law? <laughs> I mean, it just, it just sounds nuts. Yeah, and there's also this disconnect between, you know, I mean, it, it makes some sense to have um, territories of governments around the world. I mean, you know, America, America's jurisdiction governs the American territory because that covers all the real objects within it. So at least theoretically you could have that done that way. But the IP idea sort of inexorably leads not only to a one a one world government, but to a one universe government, right? In other words, yeah. by the idea of IP, there might be some guy on another planet, on another solar system, doing, uh, you know, using an iPod right now, and he invented it after Steve Jobs, right? Yeah. Or, or Apple, and so he's violating Apple's IP rights, and yet Apple doesn't know this. So maybe someday we'll have to have a big arbitration at the end of the universe and everyone settle up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is true. I had not thought about it from that standpoint, but you're right. It uh, it it does kind of force this sort of one universe uh, idea if you're actually going to have to be consistent, because otherwise you end up having to say, well, he couldn't have known. But that's no defense in what we have now. Well, not, well, not only that, it sort of it, it, it brings in the idea of a right that can be violated without the victim even knowing about it. I mean, you know. The whole idea of rights that we're used to in familiar terms involves a victim who is pissed off about, you know, being raped or killed or trespassed or whatever, and they want to do something about it. They want to stop it or get redressed for it or get a law passed to, 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 to minimize its occurrence. Mm -hmm. But the idea that right now there's someone out there violating my rights and I don't know about it is sort of nonsense. I mean, or, or forget the universal example of the science fiction. I mean, there could be a guy right now in Cuba Right, and he he saw on television uh, the, the Dyson uh, vacuum cleaner, and he might have made one, and he's using it. Well, mm -hmm. according to Ayn Rand and Galambos and and uh, these uh, IP advocates, he's stealing their ideas. Yeah. And yet they don't even know it, and he's not. They're not being harmed. Yeah, that that is that is indeed correct. Um, you know, it's like uh, it, we always end up having this this competition between atoms and ideas, and you know that you can own atoms or you can own ideas, but if you but they are, they are inherently sort of in conflict because if you claim that you can own ideas, then obviously you uh, you have the right over someone else's atoms. Yeah. And 
you know, one of the things which, uh, you know, any time I think of a crime, a crime involves either damage to to a person, to that person's property, or at least, or the, depri- the forcible deprivation of that person's time. Right. I mean, you're dealing with one of those sorts of things, and IP is one of those things that it does none of those. I know. I agree. And and it's it's it's, um, it's one of these things that um, you know it, it's 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 almost like the positive rights that are created by liberals, right? And, and the idea that um, what's wrong with adding a right a right to food and a right to education. And they don't realize or they don't care that these come at the expense of people's liberty and people's other property. But so the same is true of IP rights. I mean, these IP rights are not enforced in this imaginary, idealistic IP realm. They're enforced in the real world. They're enforced against real property. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you get a court order taking your real money or, or telling you you can't use your real property in this way. So really it's, a, it's, it's an infringement or, or it's an incursion into the territory of property rights and tangible things that people already own. So it all it almost all, it, it necessarily comes at the expense of real property rights. Yeah. And you know, I think I think that one of the reasons why it's so insidious is because it does appeal to people's ideas of fairness because I could easily visualize some small something that sort of resembles in a very small way copyright in a free market. I mean, if, if, if a guy wrote a book and there's a big bookseller and he goes to sell his book, I can easily see that a bookseller, as part of just their corporate policy, would buy the book from him rather than just going to someone else uh, who, was, who was simply copying the book. That has a lot to do with the PR. I mean, they, it's the same sort of impetus behind fair trade coffee. Um, you know, that, that this is appealing to people's sense of fairness. And, and I could easily see authors being able to make money off of appealing to people's sense of fairness. But they want to then take that and actually turn it into a real right where you have the right to aggress against people. And therein, that's well, where we have the problem. I said, hear the music. I think I better close for Peter. I, it's, it's been nice having you on the Peter Max show. All right. And we'll do this again. Well, nice talking to you. You too. Bye. KT Ordnance offers the best ATF-approved 80% kits that can be made into firearms. And when you build your own firearm, you know it inside and out. You know how it fires. You take pride in ownership. Head to KTOrdnance.com for a great father-son or father-daughter firearm build. Like the 45 caliber KT-1911. Or choose the 50 caliber KTP-50 that fires a 275-grain bullet for pure stopping power. KT Ordnance's kits are fully legal, ATF-approved, 80% firearm kits with no serial numbers, no background check, and no government. 4473 forms to fill out. Go to ktordnance.com and get yours today. That's K-T-O-R-D-N-A-N-C-E.com. Ktordnance.com. Building your own firearm is fun and you acquire useful skills, especially at times like these. Remember, when you build your own firearm, you know it inside and out. KT Ordnance also accepts gold and silver payments. Visit ktordnance.com today. The time is now. As the walls are closing in on America, Republic Magazine is a beacon of light guiding those that fight for freedom and the restoration of America. Republic Magazine is the ultimate activist tool. Republic Magazine digs in deep to expose the lies and offers real solutions from the experts. No other publication in America offers the real news like Republic Magazine. Get copies to give to friends, family, and neighbors, or simply order a subscription for yourself at republicmagazine.tv. Get informed and stay informed with Republic Magazine, the ultimate resource for your fight against the New World Order. Claim your free digital copy now or order a print subscription online at www.republicmagazine.tv. That's republicmagazine.tv. Or call them toll-free at 800-873-1620. That's 1-800-873-1620. question for you. Do you know what is in the air you're breathing? Do you know what chemicals are placed in the water you drink? Would you like to combat these intrusions? I'm not just talking toxins. I'm talking about chemicals that are harmful. Maybe now you understand why you feel tired so much. Change your life with Life Change Tea. Cleanse from toxins and chemicals and lose weight. Receive energy. There is no better investment 
strengthens in your body. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Or you can call us at 928-308-0408. That's 928-308-0408. Friendly operators will take your order and answer your questions. Be set free and live better. GetTheTea.com. 